Let not my reader suppose that we stopped our labor and went at trying to win the faculty of a brack, drawing magic circles, or soothsaying, to the neglect of all kinds of business. We never during our lives suffered one important interest to swallow up every other obligation. Lucy Mac Smith Hi, I'm Dan Vogel. In the 1845 draft of her history, Joseph Smith's mother, Lucy, denied that her family was unduly preoccupied in the idle search for a buried treasure. Her language was sarcastic, but she admitted they were involved in the occult, specifically mentioning the use of spells and amulets, like the health-promoting abracadabra amulet, drawing magic circles to control treasure guardian spirits, otherwise known as necromancy, and soothsaying, a pejorative term for fortune-telling, or foretelling future events, which in this context no doubt referred to astrology. Joseph Smith's use of a seer stone to search for buried treasure and lost or stolen objects prior to his so-called translation of the Book of Mormon and becoming the Mormon prophet is well documented. Not only Joseph Smith, but also his father, Joseph Smith Sr., and other family members participated and led in treasure digs with their neighbors and other acquaintances. In 2015, the LDS Church released photographs of Joseph Smith's brown seer stone. According to eyewitnesses, he used this stone to translate the Book of Mormon, but it was first used by Smith to locate buried treasure. This stone isn't the only artifact passed down to us, bearing witness of the Smith family's involvement in ritual magic and astrology in association with treasure digging. In this video, I will be discussing the magic parchments and ceremonial dagger that were handed down through Hiram Smith's descendants, as well as the Jupiter talisman passed down through Emma Smith's relatives. In his 1953 novel, the go-between, L.P. Hartley wrote, The past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. This is certainly true of our subject today. From historical sources, we learn that Joseph Smith wasn't just a scryer of buried treasure and lost objects, but also employed ceremonial magic as a means of controlling the spirit, as it was believed, that was set to guard the treasure or to break the curse or enchantment that was placed on the treasure. In June 1828, Joseph Smith lost the first 116 pages of his manuscript of the Book of Mormon and he and Emma lost their first child at birth. About this time, Joseph Smith began attending Methodist class meetings in Harmony, Pennsylvania, with his wife's family. Emma's cousin, Joseph Lewis, recalled in 1879, We thought it was a disgrace to the church to have a practicing necromancer, a dealer in enchantments and bleeding ghosts, in it. So church leaders confronted Smith and asked him to renounce his claims or withdraw from the class. He chose the latter. Joseph Smith was considered a necromancer because he not only saw the location of buried treasures in his seer's stone, but also the spirits guarding them. Lewis's mention of bleeding ghosts is a reference to Joseph Smith's claim to have seen a ghost with its throat cut in connection with digging for Spanish treasure in 1825 on what was called Bend Mountain in Harmony, Pennsylvania. No doubt, Lewis's charge of necromancy included the spirit in charge of the gold plates. Later, Smith would attempt to evade the charge of necromancy by claiming he had been given temporary charge of the plates by a resurrected being named Moroni. In 1833, neighbor William Stafford said Joseph Smith Sr. came to him one night and invited him to participate in a treasure dig. He said his son, Joseph Jr., had located with his seer stone two or three kegs of gold and silver near the Smith home. 
Stafford said he accompanied the senior Smith to the spot, whereupon Joseph Sr. first made a circle, 12 or 14 feet in diameter. This circle, said he, contains the treasure. He then stuck in the ground a row of witch hazel sticks around the said circle for the purpose of keeping off the spirits. Within this circle, he made another of about eight or ten feet in diameter. He walked around three times on the periphery of this last circle, muttering to himself something which I could not understand. He next stuck a steel rod in the center of the circles, and then enjoined profound silence upon us, lest we should arouse the evil spirit who had the charge of these treasures. After we had dug a trench about five feet in depth around the rod, the old man by signs and motions asked leave of absence, and went into the house to inquire of young Joseph the cause of our disappointment. He soon returned and said that Joseph had remained all this time in the house, looking in his stone and watching the motion of the evil spirit, that he saw the spirit come up to the ring, and as soon as it beheld the cone, which we had formed around the rod, it caused the money to sink. We then went into the house, and the old man observed that we had made a mistake in the commencement of the operation. If it had not been for that, said he, we should have got the money. Stafford's account follows well-known occult practice of drawing magic circles around the treasure. Like this woodcut from a 1532 German work, showing four men standing in a magic circle, one holding a magic book, one holding a sword, one holding the lantern, and one digging, while a menacing demon stands at the edge of the circle. There are many examples of magic circles being used for treasure digging, for protection against evil spirits, for calling forth the spirits of the departed, or for invocating good spirits or angels. This engraving depicts the famed 16th century astrologer John Dee and his co-occultist and scryer Edward Kelly, standing in a magic circle in a church cemetery while invoking the spirit of a deceased woman. This copper plate engraving was created about 1790 and appeared in Ebenezer Sibley's New and Complete Illustration of Occult Sciences. I obtained this one from the 1807 edition. A similar image appeared in an 1825 book titled The Astrologer of the Nineteenth Century, written by Robert Cross Smith under the pseudonym of Raphael. There are several other images in the same book depicting magic circles. This one shows the necromancer within his protective circle invocating the spirit of a woman. Two other images show circles for raising the spirits known as Oberian and Egan. Yet another illustration shows a talismanic circle for destroying all kinds of venomous or troublesome insects or reptiles. So, this summer, forget about insect spray and instead just draw this magic circle around your picnic table and you should be just fine. Closer to Joseph Smith's time and place, is Silas Hamilton's 1780s notes of the locations of mines and buried treasures in Whittingham, Vermont, which includes instructions for making a magic circle. Take nine steel rods about 10 or 12 inches in length, sharp or piked to pierce into the earth, and let them be besmeared with fresh blood from a hen mixed with hog dung. Then make two circles round the hid treasure one of said circles, a little larger in circumference than the hid treasure, lays in the earth, the other circle some larger still. And as the hid treasure is wont to move to the north or south, east or west, place your rods as is described on the other side of this leaf. Historical sources also report the importance of astrology in connection with the Smith's money digging operations. William Stafford said Joseph Smith Sr. and Jr. claimed at certain times these treasures could be obtained very easily. At others, the obtaining of them was difficult. The facility of approaching them depended in a great measure on the state of the moon. New Moon and Good Friday, I believe, 
were regarded as the most favorable times for obtaining these treasures. Again, Stafford's account is consistent with what was practiced by money diggers generally. As early as 1729, Benjamin Franklin wrote, The astrologers with whom the country swarms at this time are often consulted about the critical times for digging, the methods of laying the spirit, and the like whimsies, which renders them very necessary to and very much caressed by the poor deluded money hunters. Given testimony such as William Stafford's, we should not be surprised when we find artifacts associated with ceremonial magic and astrology handed down through members of the Smith family. The first artifacts to discuss are these three magic parchments, two of which fold into fourths and fit into this four inch by four inch leather pouch. These artifacts, along with a ceremonial dagger, were handed down among Hiram Smith's descendants. Since Hiram was not associated with treasure digging, it is likely that he inherited them from his father after his death in 1840, or possibly earlier from his older brother Alvin, who died in 1823. Alvin was known to have participated with Willard Chase in digging for treasure in association with Walters the Magician. Hiram's descendants were also in possession of Alvin's lap desk. However, as I will discuss later, the probable dating of the holiness to the Lord parchment would exclude Alvin. The provenance of these artifacts apparently followed the patriarchal line of the Smith family. They were in possession of Patriarch Eldred G. Smith when they were photographed in the 1980s prior to being published in D. Michael Quinn's 1987 Early Mormonism and the Magic World View. The parchments and dagger are now located in the LDS Church History Library in Salt Lake City. The leather pouch is worn by the magician around the neck and rests on the chest. Here is a similar bag referenced by Quinn, published in a German book in 1927, where it is referred to as an amulet bag and dates to the 18th or 19th century. These bags, which are also called talisman bags, conjure bags, charm bags, medicine bags, gris gris or mojo bags, and spell sachets, have existed since ancient times in many cultures and are still in use today. They can contain various items, including texts, herbs, minerals, or special stones. This last item, reminding us of the recently released photos of Joseph Smith's seer stone and leather bag. The contents often are meaningful to the wearer and can be made to serve various purposes, such as warding off evil, protecting against disease and ensuring good health, promoting wealth and prosperity, and aiding in contacting spirits, both good and evil. These parchments are often referred to as laymen or the Latin pronunciation, lawman or lamen. Lamen in Latin means plate, and is used in this instance because magic laymans, according to Francis Barrett's 1801 book, The Magus, one of the primary sources for the study of ceremonial magic, can be made of metal, wax, or pure white paper with convenient colors. As mentioned, laymans are meant to be worn by the magician on the chest, like a breastplate, as this 1726 engraving by William Hogarth shows. 17th century occultist Ebenezer Sibley said that the magician's attire should include the two seals of the earth drawn correctly upon virgin parchment and affixed to the breast of his outer vestment. Sibley included a plate showing the two seals of the earth without which no spirits will appear. As we shall see, the Smith parchments were made primarily for protection against evil spirits, although Joseph Smith was known to have seen and sometimes communed with guardian spirits, including the one in charge of the gold plates. Recall William Stafford's account of Joseph Smith looking in his stone and watching the motions of the evil spirit. Laymen have been described as a sort of coat of arms that expresses the character and powers of the wearer. 
They can also be designed to aid in a specific goal. During the early 19th century, an English herbal doctor and magician named John Parkins produced hundreds of his holy consecrated laymans, which he created according to requests received by mail. In 1819, he published a book called The Book of Miracles, filled with testimonials of the efficacy of his laymans, which he introduced with the following words. The instrument by which all these miracles herein after mentioned have been performed is an article which we have daily on sale, called, for distinction's sake, Our Holy Consecrated Laymans. These never-failing, holy, consecrated laymans, etc., are here made to do and perform any lawful subject, matter, or thing, whatsoever that is found to be agreeable to and consistent with the will of God, and are indeed a most valuable treasure, seeing that they totally prevent ruin, want, poverty, distress, bankruptcy, rapes, disappointments, and love, all unhappy marriages, robberies, murders, suicides, with the best method to apprehend and punish all thieves, robbers, and swindlers of every description, and, in short, will give you whatever you may hope, wish for, and desire, agreeable to the will of heaven at all times and in all places whatsoever. Others, in the same area of Little Gonerby, Graytham, England, like John Wersdale, soon followed Perkins in the mass production of layman's, which some have called Retail fortune telling. Lumen Walters was apparently the American version of Parkins. Walters, like Parkins, was a fortune teller and herbal doctor from Sodus. In the early 1820s, he was hired by Willard Chase and Alvin Smith to locate buried treasure on the Saunders property and charged them seven dollars. Decades later, Walters was still operating about twenty miles away in Gorham when Dietrich Willers, Jr. of Fayette, New York, wrote, Fortune tellers are consulted as to the future. Many in this neighborhood, where they wish to find anything which is lost, or pry into the hidden mysteries, will consult Dr. Walters. If the layman's were not created by the Smiths, perhaps someone like Walters could have made them for a fee, although Quinn reported that he could not match the handwriting on the parchments to Walters or any of the Smith family. I will now turn to an overview of the three Smith parchments. The first two are layman's, but the third is an amulet for protection against evil spirits that is folded into a small packet and placed above the door frame. The ink is faded due to an attempt to clean soot off of it, but it's still readable. Here is a reconstruction by Mark Elwood, author of the illustrated novel about Joseph Smith's money-digging years, called The Glass Looker. The circle is a magic symbol for warding off evil spirits, but the writing that winds around it is a quote from Numbers chapter 6, followed by phrases that praise God, including Jehovah, 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 and Amen, Amen, and Amen. The parchment in the middle is known as the St. Peter Bind Them Layman. This layman, for personal protection, is divided into fourths by five magic symbols with writing in each of the four quadrants, some of which also comes from Numbers chapter 6. The back also contains a magic symbol with writing in each of the four corners. The last parchment is the most detailed and ornamented with gold, black, and red ink. It is often referred to as the holiness to the Lord layman because that phrase is written on three of the edges of the parchment. The largest magic symbols occupy the center and four quadrants. There are small pentagrams in the four corners and a group of seven mysterious characters on three sides. Other symbols and astrological signs are scattered throughout. The first thing to notice is the interrelationship of the three parchments. One of the magic wheels connects all three. The second wheel appears on the Holiness to the Lord and St. Peter Bind Them parchments. In fact, all the symbols on the St. Peter Bind Them parchment are represented on the Holiness to the Lord layman. 
All but one symbol of the Jehovah 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 amulet can be found on the holiness to the Lord layman. Now that we have a general idea of what's on the three Smith parchments and their interrelatedness, I will now discuss the holiness to the Lord parchment in detail. The first thing to notice is the phrase holiness to the Lord within three of the four golden margins around the edges of the parchment. This seems to correspond to the instructions in Exodus 28.36 concerning the headpiece of Aaron's priestly vestments. And thou shalt take a plate of pure gold and grave upon it, like the engravings of a signet, holiness to the Lord. In the bottom margin is written three times the tetagrammaton, or the four Hebrew consonants for Yahweh, Y-H-W-H. Joseph Smith and most of his contemporaries would have pronounced this as Jehovah. So it is important to note that the holiness to the Lord appears three times and the tetagrammaton also appears three times. This also occurs on the Jehovah, Jehovah, Jehovah parchment to be discussed later. Moving inward on the same three sides of the parchment as the holiness to the Lord inscriptions is a thrice-repeated group of characters or symbols, what Quinn called a magic alphabet or code, that he could not identify after an extensive search through printed and manuscript collections. I recently consulted Joseph Peterson, who runs the valuable esotericarchives.com site, and he told me that he was not able to identify any source for the group of characters. In researching for this video, I may have stumbled on what might have been a major source of inspiration, if not the source, but first a few observations. Prior to this discovery, I thought the characters seemed contrived. To begin with, the characters on the ends mirror one another. Moving inward, the third character from the left and third from the right seem enclosed in parentheses, with one being disguised by making it a forward slash. This leaves the sideways S in the center. I see these characters a little differently than Quinn. While he counted nine characters or symbols with one repeating character, I see the second, third, and fourth symbols from the left as forming one character or symbol, making seven non-repeating characters. Seven is a significant number in astrology and magic. I thought the seven characters could represent alternate symbols for the planets, or angels, or intelligences, or spirits. Possible influences for inventing these characters is anyone's guess. The shapes of the characters are intriguing and seem to invite comparison to the seven planets and their signs. The two obvious comparisons are character 6, the moon, and number 5, which seems inspired by the four-shaped sign of Jupiter. I wondered if the sideways S could represent Saturn, and the sideways M-shaped characters on the ends could similarly represent Mars and Mercury. I thought number 2 had the general shape of the sun sign, divided into three parts. Finally, the forward slash of number four could be one side of the V for Venus. This was, of course, pure conjecture. The Jupiter-like character also has an interesting parallel with alchemy symbols, along with some other comparisons which I found in a collection of alchemical symbols in a 1755 German book. I noticed that two other signs are similar to Greek letters and that several have similarity to Barrett's magic alphabets. Then I found this chapbook of 24 pages by an anonymous author titled The High German Fortune Teller, first published in London about 1750, followed by several editions between about 1780 and 1825. On page 22, I found these seven characters. They appear in a spell against thieves. But before I discuss the context of these characters, I will make some observations and comparisons. The first observation to make is that the two sideways M's have feet 
as do also the two corresponding characters on the Smith parchment. The parenthesis on one side of the three-part character is slightly smaller than the other in both documents. The next four characters are nothing more than typographical symbols. Number three is a seal crow, or section sign, composed of double S's. Number four is a parallel two sign. Number five is a dagger, sometimes called an obelisk. Number six is an old-style curved pilcrow or paragraph sign. Obviously, these characters are not the ones used by the magician. The typesetter, not having the ability to reproduce the magic characters, whatever they were, used various type symbols as stand-ins. Naturally, those making copies of the spell for personal use would want to substitute these characters with more magical-looking ones. In fact, another version of the same spell against thieves, which appeared both before and after 1750, about the time when the high German fortune teller appeared, used different characters that were closer to the astrological signs of the planets. Here I have supplied five versions of the characters. There are only six characters with a little variation. The first source is the fourth edition of a work called The Shepherd's Calendar, published in 1735. The characters are a quarter moon, what might be a fancy sun sign, the sign of Saturn, an asterisk or star sign, a triangle, and a sideways M. The next edition of 1765 changed the second character to the more familiar sun sign. The third source is The Conjurer's Magazine, published in London in 1793. Here the moon sign has been reversed and the M italicized. Next, Peter Buchan's Witchcraft Detected and Prevented, first published in 1823 in Peterhead, England, changed the triangle to an upside-down V. Finally, I have included an 1827 book published in Wales, written partially in Welsh and partially in English, titled Era Potter, or Predictor of the Times, which interestingly changes the sideways M to a Greek sigma letter. Recall that I had speculated prior to this discovery that the two M's were Mars and Mercury, that the parenthetical I was a stand-in for the Sun, the sideways S stood for Saturn, the slash was Venus, the four-shaped character was Jupiter, and the Moon was the Moon. And sure enough, in the second and third positions are the signs for the Sun and Saturn. I'm using Buchan's 1823 publication because he changed the triangle to an upside-down V, which is also interesting in light of my speculation that the forward slash on the Smith parchment might represent Venus. It seems probable that the high German fortune teller is related to the Smith parchment in some way. I tend to think the holiness to the Lord parchment is a copy of a copy of a copy, although we know that Joseph Smith was quite capable of inventing characters. The text in which these characters appear is titled To Find Out a Thief. In the 1793 Conjurer's Magazine, it is titled To Find Out a Thief or Make Him or Her Bring Back the Goods Stolen. The text reads, Put down the minute when the goods were stolen and the planet ruling the day. So this done, put down the following characters on the fair piece of parchment. So turn round thrice, and if you hear no news of the thief in twenty-four hours, as ten to one you will, prick the parchment full of holes, and hang it up the chimney, where the heat of the fire may a little scorch it, and the thief will be so restless that he will bring back the goods. Rather than preventing theft, this charm is supposed to cause the thief to experience so much guilt that he or she returns the item. This deliberate scorching makes one wonder if it has something to do with the Jehovah 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 parchments being covered with soot. Not much more can be said about these characters, so I will move on to more familiar symbols on the parchment. 
The two wheel-shaped symbols in the upper right and lower left quadrant are perhaps the most significant and help identify a probable source. They do not appear in Barrett's Magus, but the late historian D. Michael Quinn found them in Reginald Scott's 1584 book, Discovery of Witchcraft, a major source for occult beliefs, despite being an expose. And in various editions of Ebenezer Sibley's new and complete illustration of occult sciences, beginning in 1784. Looking first at the symbol in the lower left and comparing it with illustrations in Scott and Sibley, we can see that they are nearly identical. The label is significant to the pursuit of treasures guarded by spirits. Whoso beareth this sign about him, all spirits shall do him homage. Quinn noticed that there was a slight difference between Scott and Sibley, and that the Smith parchment and Sibley were different from Scott in the same way, as indicated by the arrows, which Quinn argued was evidence of source. And therefore, the Smith parchment dates to some time after Sibley's first edition of 1784. A similar situation exists with the symbol in the upper right quadrant, which has a label in Sibley that reads, Whosoever beareth this sign need fear no foe. Scott has the additional phrase, but fear God. Again, Quinn focused on the one difference between the Smith parchment and Scott that seems closer to Sibley, as indicated by the arrows. He noticed that what he called the arc on Scott's version curves around the small circle, and it doesn't in the Smith parchment and Sibley. There is another slight difference that also seems significant, as indicated by the arrows. I now turn to the symbol in the upper left quadrant, known as the Omega Agla shield. Omega, of course, is the last letter of the Greek alphabet, and Agla, A-G-L-A, is believed to be a Hebrew acronym, Atta Gabor La Olam Adone, meaning, Thou art mighty forever, O Lord. Quinn said that he could not find the Agla symbol on the Smith parchment in a published source, but included a photograph of this symbol that he found in a 17th century manuscript in the Sloan Manuscript Collection in the British Museum Library. I located this symbol on the shield in this engraving in Robert Cross Smith's 1825 The Astrologer of the 19th Century, a book Quinn cited many times. As the caption states, the Omega Agla symbol is a talisman for war and battle. A quote from an ancient manuscript, which happens to be the very Sloan manuscript cited by Quinn, is included describing its power. He that beareth this sign about him shall be holpen, or helped, in every need or necessity. There seems to be a connection between the oval shape around the symbol on the parchment and the shield on the engraving. In fact, as I have been unable to find another printed source for this shield, it is likely that the 1825 book on astrology is the source, either directly or from someone else's copy of it. Artist Mark Elwood noticed that the series of lightly drawn lines on the outer edge and bottom of the oval on the parchment seems to emulate the shading on the 1825 engraving. If this analysis is correct, then the holiness to the Lord layman dates to after 1825, excluding Alvin's use of it. In the lower right quadrant is an angular-shaped magic symbol with five points and seven internal compartments. Five of the compartments contain fragments of the word tetagrammaton, which refers to the four letters of Yahweh, Y-H-W-H that is written three times in the bottom margin of the parchment. A sixth compartment in the center contains the name Adonai, or Adonai, which means Lord, as in Lord God, but is sometimes used as a divine name. The symbol is incorrectly drawn with seven blank compartments, but is correctly drawn on the St. Peter Bind Them parchment with six spaces. 
although Adonai is missing in the center. This figure appears in Sibley, but not in Scott or Barrett, or even in Germany's Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa's extremely influential Three Books of Occult Philosophy, published in 1533 in Latin and translated into English in 1651. Although it is odd-shaped, it still has five points like a pentagram or five-pointed star. While not illustrated in Scott, Barrett, or Agrippa, they do discuss various kinds of pentacles. Barrett, for example, includes instructions concerning pentacles, conformable to any number, stating that there must be written thereupon in all the several angles some divine name, or of so many letters of a name. Now, such a name being found, whether it be only one name or more, or diverse names, it is to be written in all the several angles in the figure. But in the middle of the figure, let the revolution of the name be wholly and totally placed, or at least principally. Barrett also gives what he calls the ten general names to be written in the compartments, either in part or in whole. It is important to note that while the St. Peter bind them parchment and Sibley leave the center compartment blank, the holiness to the Lord parchment fills it with a done. This will become significant later. At the center of the parchment is what Quinn called the twelve-pointed Raphael star, composed of four overlapping triangles, which is represented only in Barrett's Magus. Some have called it a double seal of Solomon, or Star of David, only that four isosceles triangles are used instead of two equilateral triangles. I have found an example of the latter type in a German work dating to circa 1780. Barrett and Agrippa instruct that the center of the layman be reserved for the name of one of the seven good spirits or angels. Barrett, for example, states, and in the center of the layman draw a hexagon or character of six corners, or in other words, a seal or pentacle of Solomon, which is a hexagram that forms a hexagon in the center. Other stars can also be used, and Barrett refers readers to the plate showing examples of pentacles, seals, and laymans, which includes the Raphael star. After the star is drawn, Barrett instructs, let there be written the name and character of the star, or of the spirit his governor, to whom the good spirit that is to be called is subject. The creator of the smith layman chose Raphael, probably because it would aid in laying the spirit, as Benjamin Franklin expressed it. However, as we will see, Raphael is incompatible with Barrett's instruction. According to magic lore, Raphael is one of the four angels that rules over the four corners of the world and has charge of the west wind. He is also one of nine angels ruling over the heavens and rules over Mercury. He is associated with the sun, which produces metals, including gold and silver. He rules over Wednesday and at various hours of every day of the week. Raphael, the angel of healing and protection, is not mentioned in the Bible, but appears in the apocryphal book of Tobit, where he declares, I am Raphael, one of the seven holy angels, which present the prayers of the saints, and which go in and out before the glory of the Holy One. Perhaps important to the creator of the Smith Layman is the story in Tobit about Raphael, mentioned by Barrett, where Raphael did apprehend the demon called Asmodeus and bound him in the wilderness of the Upper Egypt. So Raphael is known to both bind demons and petition God on behalf of mortals. In a September 1842 epistle to the church, Joseph Smith reviewed various angelophanies associated with the founding of his church, including Moroni, Michael the Archangel, Gabriel, and Raphael. While his history mentions Moroni and Michael, there are no details about Gabriel and Raphael. Barrett further instructs that within the points of the star, there should be written the names of the spirits we would call together at once. Barrett calls for five points of the star to be filled, 
and the creator of the Smith Layman fills the compartments of the tips of all four triangles and two additional minor points, as well as the center, with names written in Hebrew characters. These eight names are found in Barrett, in both English and Hebrew, in his table of divine names corresponding with the numbers of the planets, with the names of the intelligences and demons or spirits, subject to those names. These are the two pages in Barrett where the Hebrew words in the Smith Lehman are listed and arranged in categories of the seven planets, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, the Sun, Venus, Mercury, and the Moon. The creator of the Smith Lehman chose names from each group. This graphic shows each of the Hebrew words in the Raphael star on the Smith Lehman and the categories in Barrett's chart. The Hebrew words are exact matches. Of the eight Hebrew designations, two seem most significant, the intelligence of Mars and the spirit of Venus. The rest are divine names associated with the planets. Mars seems the most significant, since it contributes both the important name of Adonai in the center compartment, and Graphiel, the intelligence of Mars, occupying the compartment corresponding to the east. However, this is incompatible with Raphael, who rules over Mercury. According to Agrippa and Barrett, the angel who rules over Graphiel is Kamel. To be consistent with the naming of Raphael in the center of the star, the creator of the layman should have chosen Tyriel, the good spirit or intelligence of Mercury. The method for choosing which names to use on the layman is unknown, at least to me, because Barrett and Agrippa didn't give any instructions. Quinn believed the prominence of Mars was due to it being the ruling planet over the year of Joseph Senior's birth in 1771, but this seems unlikely to me. There is no indication that the Creator's birth sign had anything to do with filling the compartments in the Raphael star. Rather, the Creator chose Mars and Raphael because he deemed them to be beneficial to the task of protecting against evil spirits. Barrett instructs that it will be more conducive to the effect to add some divine name appropriate to the effect which we desire. This probably explains why Adone, God's name associated with Mars, is in the center with Raphael. Mars, the god of war, continues the theme of the shield discussed earlier. According to Barrett, the intelligences, in this case Graphiel, the intelligence of Mars, are the presiding good angels that are set over the planets. Carrying a certain image of Mars, he says, renders a man powerful in good and evil, so that he shall be feared by all, no doubt including evil spirits. Another similar image of Mars was for obtaining boldness, courage, and good fortune in wars and contentions. Sibley says, Mars gives fortitude in war and affliction. If one is to contend against evil spirits and bleeding ghosts, then he would do well to have Mars, the god of war, on his side. Barrett also states that the spirits or demons, in this case Ketamel, the spirit of Venus, with their names, seals, or characters are never to be inscribed upon any talisman, except to execute any evil effect, and that they are subject to the intelligences or good spirits. Perhaps the creator of the smith parchment intended the invoking of Ketamil would have an evil effect on the treasure guardian spirits. Barrett assigned a number to each Hebrew word. For instance, Adone equals 65. This number is derived by adding up the numerical equivalent of each letter of the word. Barrett gives the numbers assigned to each letter of the Hebrew alphabet on page 140. Observing that all the Hebrew characters on the Raphael star add up to 687, Quinn believed that he might discover the author of the Smith parchment if he could find someone with the same number by using a system with the Latin alphabet worked out by Agrippa in the 17th century for a different purpose. Quinn applied this numbering system to each member of the Smith family and others associated with the Smiths in treasure digging, but found no match. 
Joseph Smith's name, for example, adds up to 459 using Agrippa's system, and Lumen Walters, without an S, comes close with 697. Even if Quinn had found someone who matched the number 687, it would have proved nothing because Barrett didn't intend his number system to be used in that manner. As far as I can tell, no one but Quinn had an expectation that the number 687 would be connected to the creator of the layman or to any person. There is nothing on the parchment or in Barrett to imply such was the case. Quinn claimed the idea came from Peter Buchan's 1823 book, Witchcraft Detected and Prevented, but the system described in that book is unrelated to Barrett's system. Buchan's instructions concerning the making of a certain layman for the prevention of witchcraft was that the person's number actually be written on the parchment, along with other numbers and names. Specifically, he recommended writing the sign of Jupiter on the parchment, followed by the zodiac signs of Virgo, Libra, and Scorpio, and then this number, 13257, 1-1, 1-7, 1-4th. Then, after this, set down the number of the figurative letters in your name. All this demonstrates is that a person's name could produce a number and that it could be used in making a particular layman. This concept doesn't translate well to the holiness to the Lord layman. They are completely different. As far as I am concerned, Quinn's theory is highly problematic and doubtful. Now that we have discussed the large symbols that occupy the center and quadrants, we can turn to the two smaller symbols, which are called in ceremonial magic the Paul Lipa and Nalga symbols. They are also found on the front and back of the St. Peter Bind Them layman. Scott and Sibley are the only known printed sources for the Paul Lipa and Nalga symbols, but as can be seen here with the Paul Lipa symbol, the shape of the Maltese crosses on the Smith Laymans are closer to Sibley's. Paul Lipa is the second of seven good angels of ceremonial magic. Sibley describes this angel's attribute. Paul Lipa, whose peculiar office it is to guard and forewarn such as are virgins and uncontaminated youth against all the evils of debauchery and prostitution, and to elevate the mind to a love of virtue, honor, and revealed religion. He personifies the character of an illustrious angel of a bright but most complacent countenance, and is known by the following magical symbol, which is worn about the neck of virgins as a protection from all the assaults of evil demons, and it is said to be infallible against the powers of seduction. Assuming the parchment was used by Joseph Smith, Quinn argued that it must date to his pre-1827 years before his marriage to Emma. However, while Sibley's description seems to limit the Pailapa symbol to use by virgins, his source, Scott's discovery of witchcraft, could be read as only one aspect of the symbol. Pa Lai Pa, one of the powers accompanying such as are virgins and devoted to religion and a hermit's life. He teacheth all the names and powers of angels and gives holy charms against the assaults of evil demons. Scott's description is much shorter than Sibley's, but the second sentence could be read as stating that in addition to use by virgins, the angel Pa Lai Pa teacheth all the names and powers of angels and gives holy charms against the assaults of evil demons. The Pa Lai Pa symbol also appears on the St. Peter Bind Them parchment, and the creator or creators of these parchments may have had a more general application of the symbol in mind. The Nalga symbol also appears on both the Holiness to the Lord and St. Peter Bind Them parchments. Nalga is the third of seven angels of ceremonial magic, and his symbol on the Smith parchments is closest to Sibley's illustration. Sibley describes Nalga's attributes as devoted to the protection of those who are assaulted by evil spirits or witches and whose minds are sunk by fearful and melancholy apprehensions of the assaults of the devil and the power of death. 
His proper office is to fortify the mind and to lead the senses to a contemplation of the attributes of God and the joys of heaven, the reward of all good works. His appearance is represented as perfectly celestial, having a crown of gold upon his head with a shield and spear in his hands for the protection of those over whom he presides. The following is his magical character, which is worn around the neck as a preservation against witchcraft and suicide. Again, we see the need for protection against the assaults of the devil and the use of the shield as a symbol. The IHS, written above the Nalga symbol, could stand for either In hoc signo or Jesus hominum salvator. As Quinn noted, In hoc signo originally represented the first three letters of the Latin words of Constantine's conversion vision of the cross. In hoc signo winkus. In this sign, conquer, and that medieval Christians changed it to Jesus hominum salvator at which time I and J were not distinguished in Latin, translated as Jesus, Savior of Man. While IHS appears on other magic parchments and amulets, there is no explanation of such use in Agrippa, Sibley, or Barrett. Quinn believed that IHS was designed to help the user obtain supremacy over spirits, particularly evil spirits. Interestingly, the phrase in hoc winkus, without the C, appears at the top of the engraving of the talismanic shield in Robert Cross Smith's 1825, The Astrologer of the 19th Century, which makes no sense, but seems to be a corruption of in hoc signo winkus, in this sign conquer. Moving to the smaller symbols, the most obvious are the pentagrams in the four corners, with their central pentagons painted gold. Scattered throughout the spaces between the large symbols are various small astrological symbols, both signs of the zodiac and planet signs in gold paint. All twelve birth signs are apparently represented, and at least seven planet signs, Sun, Moon, Earth, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Uranus. Missing are Mercury and Saturn. Neptune and Pluto weren't discovered until 1846 and 1930, respectively. The final symbol to be discussed on the Holiness to the Lord parchment are the three crosses painted in gold, which I think are very obviously what Quinn also recognized as a reference to the crucifixion at Golgotha. Clearly, what we are dealing with here is Christian or white magic, not black or satanic magic. At least, this is how the practitioners viewed themselves. The second layman to discuss in more detail is the St. Peter Bind Them parchment. We have already discussed all the symbols on this layman in association with the Holiness to the Lord parchment. Instead of being surrounded by astrological and planetary symbols, this layman has an English text. On the back, with the Nalga symbol in the center, are five words in each of the four corners. Bind evildoers from me. On the front left side, written sideways, is a prayer from Numbers 6, verses 24 through 27. When turned, the left side reads, The Lord bless me and keep me. The Lord make his face shine upon me and be gracious unto me. The Lord lift his countenance upon me and give me peace. Yahweh. This part of the quote changes the biblical wording slightly by replacing thee with me and adding the tetragrammaton at the end. The quote continues with verse 27 on the right side. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. Jehovah. This part of the quote similarly concludes with the name of deity, Jehovah. The personalization of the first three verses of this prayer, by changing thee to me, was commonplace. It was standard in books of prayer and devotion, well into the 19th century, especially with the Church of England. The main text of this layman appears on the right side, a portion of which is difficult to decipher. St. Peter, bind them, St. Peter, bind them. In the name of Jesus Christ, may every hair of their head be as heavy as a millstone that desires to set fire or destroy this body. Fail not, fail not, fail not. Catch them. The thrice repeated, fail not, is my provisional transcription, since a comparison of the various letter formations 
raises questions. One reading is fait ayet, which makes no sense. The first word might be a misspelling of the Latin word fiat, let it be done, which has significant religious connotation, and some spells end with fiat repeated three times, followed by amen. Fiat ayet means let it be. However, if the two words were intended to be one word, vaitayata, it would mean he will make a noise. Perhaps a manuscript might be found to shed light on this difficult reading. The text begins with the repetition of St. Peter bind them, which relates to the repeated text on the back, bind evil doers from me. Although thieves are not mentioned in the Smith parchment, it very clearly reflects the genre of spells against thieves. Repetition of St. Peter points to northern Germany and the Netherlands, as Quinn demonstrated quite clearly. In Volume 3 of Benjamin Thorpe's massive collection of northern mythology, comprising the principal popular traditions of Scandinavia, North Germany, and the Netherlands, published in London in 1852, there are three versions of the St. Peter Bind Them charm against thieves. In all three versions, thieves try to steal the child Jesus from the Virgin Mary, who utters this charm against them. In the first version of To Fix a Thief, Thorpe gives both the German from an old manuscript and English translation, wherein Mary declares, Bind, Peter, bind, hastily and quick, that the thief may stand still as a stock and cry like a goat. Bind, Peter, bind, that the thief may stand still and count all the stars that stand in the heavens. Bind, Peter, bind, that the thief may stand still. Thorpe explains, this spell is to be uttered after sunset, the utterer, at the same time, going three times round the place to which he supposes the thief will come. While so doing, he must not look about, and must stop exactly at the point from which he started, and then say thrice, in the name of, etc. On the following morning, the thief will be found fast bound to the spot. He must then loose him with these words. Here, thief, I hereby release thee, in the name of, etc. But this must be done before sunrise, else the thief will turn black and die within a year. The invocation of St. Peter and binding a thief to the spot provides the contextual background for the smith parchment and explains the phrase, catch them. Each hair, becoming heavy as a millstone, would do the trick. A 16th century manuscript book in the British Museum, written partly in English and partly in Latin, contains an interesting spell against thieves, according to an early 19th century catalog. The old Gothic English introduction reads, Whosoever say these verses hereafter following, there shall no thief nor enemy have power to hurt him, nor rob him, by the grace of God. Then follows a Latin incantation about Jesus, the key part of which reads, Let them be immovable like a stone, until your wrath, O Lord, breaks through. Immovable like a stone is less dramatic, but it's close to the millstone of the smith parchment. Quinn also showed that the St. Peter Bind Them spell was brought to America and published among the Pennsylvania Dutch in the 1820s. There doesn't appear to be an English version of the St. Peter Bind Them spell in print during Joseph Smith's lifetime, although there are spells in Scott, Sibley, and other books dealing with the discovery of the thief's identity or with causing a curse to come upon the thief until he returns the stolen property. But the St. Peter formula was evidently unavailable in English, at least in print. That doesn't mean that the creator of the parchment had to know German any more than the holiness to the Lord parchment required knowledge of Hebrew. Evidently, it eventually made its way into the wider folk magic culture, either from Pennsylvania or from immigrating Germans flowing through New York City during the first decades of the 19th century establishing settlements along the Hudson River and Mohawk Valleys, and providing significant populations in Albany and Buffalo. The creator of this charm was concerned about all kinds of evildoers, not just thieves, but also those who might persecute or martyr him by fire 
for being heterodox or heretical in his practice of religion, as evidenced by the occult symbols on this parchment. It's hard to imagine that someone in Joseph Smith's time and place had such worries. Death by fire calls to mind the burning of so-called heretics and witches in England and Europe up to the mid-18th century. The wording, perhaps, is due to its being copied from a manuscript with a long lineage. Although the handwriting is the same for both the Holiness to the Lord and St. Peter Bindham parchments, differences in the drawings of the Omega Agla shield suggest that they weren't copied directly out of Robert Cross Smith's 1825 book, and that differences between the two parchments also suggest that they had different lineages. I now turn to the last Smith family parchment, typically referred to as the Jehovah 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 Lehman. This parchment is faded and at one time folded more times than the other two. For purposes of study, I will use this very carefully reconstructed version created by Mark Elwood, who has created reproductions of all the parchments and produced two graphic novels dealing with Joseph Smith's early treasure digging. As previously mentioned, this is an amulet to protect someone's house from evil spirits. Quinn found a near-duplicate version dating to the 1880s discovered above the door frame in the bountiful Utah home of Henry James Harrison, an English convert who immigrated in the 1860s. The Jehovah 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 parchment is strikingly different than the other two Smith parchments. First, the handwriting is unclear and faded, but it appears to be different. We have already seen that the central symbol appears on the other two parchments, and that whosoever beareth this sign need fear no foe. However, the Jehovah 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 parchment differs from the other two in that what might be called the spokes of the wheel are connected to the rim in the Smith and Harrison versions. Also, the triangular shape at the end of the middle left spoke is markedly larger than what appears on Scott and Sibley. This caused Quinn to speculate that the Smith and Harrison parchments were based on a common source, undoubtedly published but still unidentified. I don't think it had to be a published source. But, at the very least, they apparently had different manuscript lineages back to a common source, published or unpublished. The Smith parchment includes two symbols that are not on the Harrison version. A pentagram with a sun symbol in the center and a complex symbol that represents the first angel of the seven good angels discussed by Scott and Sibley. This angel's name is Juban la Des or Juban la Dachi. Sibley's description of this angel is slightly different than Scott's in a way that might have been meaningful to the Smiths in light of Alvin's death, Juban Lades distinguished in the Dominion of Thrones as the appointed guardian of all public and national enterprises, where the good of society and the honor of God are unitedly concerned. He is delineated in all the brightness of a celestial messenger, bearing a flaming sword girded about the loins, with a helmet on his head. And this is the magical character by which he is distinguished and which is worn by many as a layman around the neck, for a preservation against putrid infection and sudden death. Based on a recreation of the faded Jehovah 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 parchment, which he provided in his book, Quinn believed the Juban Lades symbol had been copied from the earliest publication in Scott's 1665 book, not the more accessible Sibley publication. He noted that the three crosses on the Smith parchment were palmy crosses like Scott's, and not fitched Maltese crosses like Sibley's, and that the downward arrow stopped at the line like Scott's, whereas Sibley's arrow went past that point. However, the Elwood reproduction appears to be more accurate. Although badly faded, the locations of the crosses show large areas of ink and suggest Maltese rather than palmy crosses. Close examination also shows curves associated with Maltese crosses. Here, I have overlaid the original with Elwood's reproduction for accuracy, and to show that the downward arrow touches the line connected to the third cross, like Scott's, 
So the Smith parchment is similar to Scott and Sibley in different ways. As with the wheel-shaped symbol being different than both Sibley and Scott, the Jubanlade symbol is probably copied from neither source directly and most likely has an origin different than the Holiness to the Lord and St. Peter Bind Them parchments. This parchment contains both English and Latin text. The first thing to notice is that at the top, the triadic phrase Jehovah, Jehovah, Jehovah is written twice. There is a third at the end of the circular writing. The sigil, or wheel-shaped symbol, is encircled with four Latin phrases in black ink, separated by small Maltese crosses. Whoever divided the phrases in the Smith version did so incorrectly. The phrases are here transcribed. They are intended to be three phrases based on passages of Scripture. They appear in Scott's 1665 book on page 139 under the heading, A Charm to Drive Away Spirits That Haunt Any House. Scott explains that these words are to be written on virgin parchment and then to hang in every of the four corners of your house. A marginal note reads, This is called and counted the Paracelsian charm. Named after Paracelsus, the 16th century mystic and alchemist. The Latin phrases read in English, Every spirit praises the Lord. They have Moses and the prophets. And God will arise and his enemies will be scattered. They are taken from Psalms 150, verse 6, Luke 16, verse 29, and Psalm 68, verse 1. The same information appeared in Peter Buchan's 1823 Witchcraft Detected and Prevented. The English words in red ink read, Unto God's gracious mercy and protection we now commit thee. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee, and give thee peace, both now and forevermore. Jehovah, 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 and Amen, Amen, and Amen. These words are right out of the Church of England's Book of Common Prayer, which is partly based on Numbers 6, 24 through 26, the same passages quoted in the St. Peter Bind Them parchment. The Harrison parchment has the same Latin words, but different English words. Let every spirit praise the Lord God Almighty that comes unto or near this place. Fiat, 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 Jehovah, 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 Amen, Amen, Amen. One final artifact handed down through Hiram Smith's patriarchal line is a 10-inch, two-edged, needlepoint ceremonial dagger with wooden handle and occult markings on both sides of its blade. On one side is the sign or seal of Mars. This can be seen by comparing it with a plate between pages 142 and 143 in Barrett's 1801 book, The Magus. On the reverse side is the planet sign for Mars and the zodiac sign for Scorpio followed by the sign or seal for the intelligence of Mars, as indicated by the same plate in Barrett's book. The Hebrew characters represent Adone, which is listed in Barrett on page 146 under the names answering to the number of Mars, in this case, 65. As discussed previously in association with the holiness to the Lord parchment, the same chart lists Graphiel as the intelligence of Mars. Mars on the blade is not surprising, since he was the Roman god of war. Barrett states that when the seal and intelligence of Mars is engraven on an iron plate or sword, it makes a man potent in war and judgment and petitions, and terrible to his enemies. Later, Barrett says that Capricorn also is reported to keep men in safety, and also places in security, because it is the exaltation of Mars. So the planet Mars is exalted or magnified in association with Capricorn, which was Joseph Jr.'s birth sign. Quinn argued that the dagger had once belonged to Joseph Smith Sr. because it was inscribed with the magic symbol for Mars, the governing planet for his year of birth, and he was the only member of the family whose birth year was governed by Mars. 
Joseph Sr. was born on the 12th of July, 1771, in the third decan of Cancer, which is ruled by the Moon or Mercury, depending on the method of calculation. But, for some reason, Quinn believed the senior Smith identified with the planet Mars. This may have been merely coincidence. The ruling planet over the year was usually used to predict national and world events, rather than a person's character. In his 1654 book, Astrologia Restaurata, or Astrology Restored, William Ramsey, for example, included a discussion of how to know that planet, which is Lord of the Year, in any annual revolution of the years of the world. He disputed the method used by the ancients and then offered his own, which required a fairly comprehensive knowledge of astrology to calculate. However, for Ramsey, this had less to do with an individual's ruling planet than with the condition of the whole nation or people. This is reflected in Ramsey's discussion of what happens when Mars is the ruling planet. Mars, when he is lord of the year, strong and well-placed, all such as belong to arms as soldiers and the like, shall be fortunate and in good condition, and shall overcome their enemies. There shall also be during that revolution sufficient and plenty of rain, as such times and in no other, it is convenient and requisite that the people shall be prosperous and happy. There is another sense in which the term Lord of the Year was and still is used to apply to individuals. In his 1737 Universal Etymological English Dictionary, Nathan Bailey included the standard and oft-repeated definition for Lord of the Year. The Lord of the Year with astrologers. The planet that has the greatest strength in a figure of a person's nativity, and so becomes the principal significator of his temperaments, manners, affections, etc., called thence Lord of the Geniture. A person doesn't simply adopt the ruling planet for the year of his birth, as Quinn assumed. Determining an individual's Lord of the Year is a complex process, requiring a comprehensive knowledge of astrology and the exact time of a person's birth which is why it is sometimes called the Lord of the Geniture, or Lord of the Nativity. This personal planet need not be the same as the one that rules the calendar year. To determine one's ruling planet during the first year of life, knowing the hour of one's birth is essential. The ruling planet is the one rising at the time of birth. Joseph Sr. was born on a Friday, but the hour is unknown, and therefore his ruling planet is also unknown. Whatever his ruling planet was, it changed each year as it repeatedly cycled through the seven planets. This complicates Quinn's attempt to link the Mars dagger to Joseph Sr. Another problem with Quinn's interpretation is that Mars need not be the birth sign or even the year sign of the dagger's owner. It need only be the power the owner desires for a specific task. Barrett mentioned a sword in relation to the Mars markings, but it could be applied to any weapon by anyone. Since there was no discussion by Barrett of birth sign in relation to the Mars engraving, Quinn's interpretation is speculative and problematic. Quinn suggested that the Mars dagger was used to draw magic circles, and it may have been, but the ceremonial knife for drawing circles that Scott and Sibley mentioned has very different markings. Scott included an illustration as well as a discussion of what might be termed an Agla knife. Neither Sibley nor Barrett discuss the making of the Agla knife, but Sibley includes an illustration of what he calls a magical knife. Barrett instead describes an Agla sword and includes an illustration. Here is an actual Agla sword from the second half of the 14th century in what was Slovenia. And this is a 16th century Spanish or Portuguese crusader Agla dagger. None of the historical sources mention the smiths using either a dagger or a sword, although his occult mentor, Lumen Walters, reportedly used a rusty sword to draw a magic circle around a treasure and in which he sacrificed a rooster. The dagger might be used to frighten evil spirits or for personal protection against those who might want to harm the magician, as suggested in the St. Peter Bind Them parchment. But there is another possible use, 
one that Quinn told me he dared not discuss in his book, Animal or Blood Sacrifice. William Stafford, previously quoted, also recounted one instance when the senior smith requested one of his black sheep for the purpose of a sacrifice, and that Joseph Sr. told him that a black sheep should be taken on the ground where the treasures were concealed that after cutting its throat, it should be led around a circle while bleeding. This being done, the wrath of the evil spirit would be appeased. The treasures could then be obtained, and my share of them was to be fourfold. To gratify my curiosity, I let them have a large, fat sheep. They afterwards informed me that the sheep was killed pursuant to commandment, but as there was some kind of mistake in the process, it did not have the desired effect. This, I believe, is the only time they ever made money digging a profitable business. Barrett and others mention using the blood of small animals to break or cast spells. Sibley states that the spirits require certain oblations, including offerings or sacrifices of blood. Barrett specifically mentions the blood of various kinds of birds, bats, goats, cats, even humans. He even recommends using a mixture of the blood of a human and a black cat for conjuring the spirits of Mars. So blood sacrifice was an integral aspect of ceremonial magic and was practiced by Lumen Walters and the Smiths, perhaps with this very Mars dagger. Both the dagger and holiness to the Lord Parchment feature Mars as a means of protecting the magician from evil or malicious spirits, which Quinn tried to connect with Joseph Smith Sr. using questionable methodology. He also tried to connect Joseph Jr. to the Holiness to the Lord parchment because of a large Jupiter sign painted in gold at the top center. While the significance of the placement and size of this sign is conjectural, Quinn's evidence for linking Joseph Jr. with Jupiter, despite being a Capricorn, whose planet is Saturn, is stronger than it was for linking Joseph Sr. with Mars. Quinn observed that Jupiter ruled 1805, the year of Joseph Smith's birth, as well as the first deacon of his birth sign, Capricorn. The latter is more significant than the former, as I have explained. Unlike ruling years, deacons were well known to Joseph Smith's contemporaries. One source that discussed deacons was William Lilly's 1659 book, Christian Astrology. On page 104, he specifically identified Jupiter as the first deacon or face of Capricorn. A similar chart appeared in Thomas Oxley's 1830, The Celestial Planispheres, or Astronomical Charts. There is also good reason to believe Joseph Smith identified with Jupiter rather than Saturn, the ruling planet of his birth sign of Capricorn. This is supported by yet another occult artifact, a silver Jupiter talisman, said to have been in possession of Joseph Jr. at the time of his death and preserved thereafter by his wife Emma, and then by Louis Bideman, Emma's second husband, until his death in 1891, when the talisman and other Smith family relics fell into the hands of Bideman's son, Charles. On several occasions, Charles showed visitors to Nauvoo the items inherited from Emma, which included not only the talisman, but also one of the earliest manuscripts of the Book of Abraham. On the 4th of September, 1902, a young man from Utah named Henry D. Moyle recorded in his journal, A man showed us a piece of metal found in the pocket of the prophet when killed. It is about the size of a dollar. It had a Latin phrase meaning, O oh God, make me all-powerful and many. Two days later, John Henry Smith wrote in his diary, Mr. Charles E. Bideman showed us a medal said to have been carved by Joseph Smith with this inscription on it, Confirms Odius Potentissimus. In 1937, Utah businessman Wilfred C. Wood purchased the talisman for $50, along with other items, and put them in his museum in Bountiful, Utah. At the time of sale, and for many years after, the silver pendant was assumed to be a Masonic jewel but in 1974, Salt Lake City Institute of Religion director Reed C. Durham scandalized attendees of the Mormon History Association meeting in Nauvoo, Illinois, by announcing that Joseph Smith's silver medallion was, in fact, a magic Jupiter talisman. His address was published the following year by rare book dealer 
David C. Martin in his periodical called Mormon Miscellaneous. Durham had discovered that the markings on the Smith talisman followed instructions given in Barrett's 1801 book, The Magus, for making a Jupiter talisman. Smith's talisman is very similar to Barrett's illustration to what he called a seal of Jupiter, except that on the Smith talisman, the numbers in the cells of the table are Hebrew letters, and the Hebrew word above the table is missing a letter. Another illustration in Barrett's book shows the seal and intelligence of Jupiter and the numerical table in both Arabic and Hebrew versions. As previously discussed, Barrett supplies the key to the Hebrew numbers on page 140. Quinn located another Jupiter talisman from medieval England that is nearly identical to the Smith talisman, including the use of Hebrew letters in the numerical table. Other Jupiter talismans have been located since Quinn published his findings. Using a metal detector in 2015, a man from Australia found this Jupiter talisman near Bury in Lancashire, England. I located another one in the British Museum. I also found one that was published in 1847. The numerical table is what is called a magic square that adds up to 34 in every direction, and four rows of 34 add up to the magic number of 136, which appears on the talisman. The Hebrew words around the edge of the talisman play into this numerology when the letters of the words are treated as numbers. Another way to look at this is to compare it with Barrett's chart on page 146 for the names and numbers for Jupiter. On the other side is the seal, sign, and intelligence of Jupiter, and a Latin phrase, Confirma o dies potentissimus. It is unclear exactly what the phrase means, as it is fragmentary and ungrammatical. Literally, it says, Confirm, O God, all-powerful. Mormon historian Richard Anderson translated it as, Strengthen me, O Almighty God. According to Barrett, if this is engraven on a plate of silver, with Jupiter being powerful and ruling in the heavens, it conduces to gain riches and favor, love, peace, and concord, and to appease enemies, and to confirm honors, dignities, and counsels. So, Joseph Smith's possession of this Jupiter talisman is strong evidence that he identified with his decan planet of Jupiter, and the prominent positioning of the Jupiter symbol on the holiness to the Lord parchment might be an indication of his use of it, although that is not as clear as Quinn would have it. In dating the creation of the Smith parchments, Quinn observed that because the holiness to the Lord parchment relies on Sibley's occult sciences, it necessarily dates to after 1784 and before Hiram Smith's death in 1844. Not only did Quinn attempt to link the holiness to the Lord parchment specifically to Joseph Smith Sr. and Jr., but he also argued that they were probably constructed in September 1823 and associated with Joseph Jr.'s invocation of an angel spirit and first visit to the hill and discovery of the gold plates. In chapter 4, Quinn asserted that certain inscriptions pinpoint September 1823 as the time when one parchment was first manufactured or used. That was when Joseph Smith began his effort to obtain the gold plates of the Book of Mormon. In chapter 5, he similarly asserted that Smith's experience with this spirit on the night of the 21st to the 22nd of September, 1823, fits the internal dating of his family's magic parchment, designed to enable a pure youth to contact a good spirit. The holiness to the Lord's parchments inscriptions indicate that 12 through 21 of September was one of the periods it was constructed. Also, the inscriptions show that 1823 was one of only nine years the layman could have been inscribed. What nine years did Quinn have reference to? 1788, 1795, 1802, 1809, 1816, 1823, 1830, 1837, and 1844. Why these years? These were the ruling years, not for Mars, 
and even Jupiter, which he associated with Joseph Smith Sr. and Jr., but for Mercury. Why Mercury? Because the angel Raphael, who is named in the center of the twelve-pointed star at the center of the parchment, is associated with Mercury. However, there is no reason to think that the creator of the layman could only use Raphael in the star in those years. Nevertheless, Quinn attempted to narrow the date even further by referring to the weeks in the year ruled by Mercury. Using the same late 19th century history of magic he used to find the years Mercury ruled, Quinn determined that the weeks were the 30th of January to the 8th of February, 20th through the 29th of April, 4th through the 13th of July, 12th through the 21st of September, and 21st to the 30th of November each year. So, in this way, he shows that Mercury's rule included the night of the 21st of September, 1823, when Joseph Smith allegedly began communing with the Spirit. As Quinn presents it, the dates seem arbitrary. But when one checks Quinn's source, it is found that it merely lists the 36 decans covered by the seven planets, and that the dates he gives are simply the decans where Mercury rules under the signs of Aquarius, Taurus, Cancer, Virgo, and Sagittarius. Barrett gives no indication that the center of the star was to be reserved for the ruling planet of the year in which the layman was created. His instruction about the drawing of a six pointed star no doubt applies to the twelve-pointed star as well. Draw the star in the center of the layman, he instructs, and then, in the middle thereof, write the name and character of the star, or of the spirit, his governor, to whom the good spirit that is to be called is subject. The creator of the smith layman didn't follow this precisely, but the good spirit that is to be called was Graphiel, the intelligence of Mars, and one of the divine names associated with Mars is Adonai, which is written in the center with Raphael's name. Adonai, not Raphael, is the key name for the holiness to the Lord Parchment. Raphael was merely the angel being invoked for his powers. The doubled Solomon seal, or twelve-pointed star, appears on the parchment as it was depicted in Barrett's 1801 book with Raphael at the center, copied directly or indirectly out of Barrett's book. I can find no other source for it. So this is another limiting factor that dates the creation of the parchment to after 1801 instead of 1784. Raphael and the twelve-pointed star may have been chosen over the typical pentagram or hexagram for the smith layman because it seemed appropriate for their need of binding evil spirits and not because it coincided with any particular date. The main problem I have with Quinn's scenario is that I don't see these laymen being created for the purpose of invoking a manifestation of a spirit, but rather of soliciting the help of the good spirits, intelligences, and angels for protection against evil spirits and human enemies. I also don't see the Smiths creating something as elaborate and ornate as the holiness to the Lord parchment for a one-time use. It seems to me that they were kept in a leather pouch for repeated and long-term use. To further narrow the date of the parchment's creation, Quinn offered another line of argument based on Sibley's description of the pa Lai pa symbol as pertaining exclusively to virgins, as previously discussed. Quinn argued that of the years ruled by Mercury, 1823 was the one in which Joseph Jr. was still a virgin. 1816 would be too early, since the Smiths began money digging according to neighbors in 1819 or 20, and 1830 would have been too late since he had married Emma in 1827. As I have previously argued, while Sibley emphasized the virgin aspect of the pa Lai pa symbol, his source, Scott's discovery of witchcraft, was not so limiting, stating that the symbol protected the wearer against the assaults of evil demons. Probably the greatest problem with Quinn's dating of 1823 for the holiness to the Lord and St. Peter bind them parchments is the Omega Agla shield, which appears to have been copied from a source that was indebted to Robert Cross Smith's 
1825 book. So, despite Quinn's interpretation, 1823 seems implausible for various reasons. In such case, one might date the parchments to Joseph Smith's activities in association with Josiah Stoll's treasure quest in Harmony, Pennsylvania in November 1825, except that the book was published in London after September 1825, according to the preface. Apparently, the book was popular in both England and America. It was advertised for sale in several consecutive issues of the Albany Argus, beginning on the 21st of September 1827. His 1831 book, The Familiar Astrologer, introduced Smith as the author of that celebrated book, The Astrologer of the Nineteenth Century. By 1830, it was announced that the popular book was now out of print. It may be that the holiness to the Lord Parchment was created in conjunction with Joseph Smith's 1827 visit to the Hill, rather than 1823. No doubt his family anticipated his removal of the plates could draw attack from evil spirits. He had already been attacked the first time. This time he would be prepared. The St. Peter Bind Them Parchment Against Thieves seems especially pertinent to the situation since Smith's former money-digging companions believed they had a right to the plates and began immediately attempting to take them from him. In his official history, Smith said that no sooner was it known that I had them than the most strenuous exertions were used to get them from me. Every stratagem that could be invented was resorted to for that purpose. The persecution became more bitter and severe than before, and multitudes were on the alert continually to get them from me if possible. But by the wisdom of God, they remained in my hands. Perhaps the wisdom of God, and doing everything in his power to keep them, included these magic parchments. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this journey to the foreign land we call the past. I know I did. Until next time, I'm Dan Vogel. Thanks for watching.